requests the best IRL community guilt-free electricity, local foods and wholesome dudes. Lots of vests and good attitudes. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome back to the Soul Scene. Right before we started, Aaron asked me to come up with the last line for the poem, and yeah. clearly I did an excellent job. Right, well the poem, it was kind of an introduction because I wanted to get back to the heart of how we open these episodes, which is just a few nice lines describing in some way the beautiful, sustainable, tactile, ideal, utopian future, imagined something uh, so was seen for people who are new to the podcast. That's what we do here every week. And so I thought your final line would also be describing something lovely about it. It is. There'll What's be lots it? of vests. Vests. Why is that? Vests. Like yeah. outerwear vests. <laughs> yeah, why is that? There aren't enough today, and I think in the solo scene there'll be more. Okay. And of course, good attitudes. Yeah. It'll be full of those. I can tell you're struggling to run with dude. Yeah. Mm. Mood. Shrewd. Yeah. I'm not as good of a rhymer as you. Nobody's rude. Nobody's rude. But the good attitudes is more of a positive way of spinning that. So welcome back to the solo scene, everybody. This week we're talking about nature. This is a series that we're doing, imagining how nature will be integrated into the ideal future. We asked questions last week, and this week we're going to answer them. Before we get started, if you like us, you can subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're listening to give a rating, review, etc. You can also buy our zine, which we make. We have now three zines, one for degrowth, one for education, and one for nature. Those are really cool, handmade, very fun, small magazines, micro zines. Zines. Yeah. So the first question for today is, what is the relevance, if any, of the deep sea ooh, to the solo scene? Mm. So... Here with me today talking about this question is aspiring marine biologist, aesthetic marine biologist, some may call him, <laughs> yeah. Aaron. And so, Aaron, what do you think about this question? In the solo scene, the ideal future, will the deep sea have any part in society and culture, or will it just be, we leave it untouched, we don't think about it? Well, I like your introduction for me, first and foremost, so mm -hmm. thank you for that. I like that new job title, the AMB, aesthetic marine biologist. Um, I really like the deep sea, as you kind of alluded to. I think science exploration i think that's a very fun thing that society needs i think that it's been a little bit too twisted into only a commercial outlet mm -hmm. you know what i mean like almost all invention and innovation today is in the name of r d or profiteering but i think that there is value to exploration and discovery for the sake of it that being said there might also be some helpful little treasures deep below. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any? I don't know of any, but when I was answering this question, I said in the solar scene, likely some of the innovations that got us to that point came from exploring the deep sea. Mm. So perhaps there's some kind of a key to energy efficiency down there because there's those bioluminescent creatures. Ooh. So maybe we can harness that, some kind of bioluminescence for... Mm lighting our houses yes i'm not exactly sure but the solar scene is all sustainable and it's like post climate change post disaster and everything so i was picturing perhaps in the next 10 to 100 years we go down there we find a few cures we find a few <laughs> cool techniques to like light things or heat things and then we use them in the solar scene well it's funny you mentioned cures because this was news to me this week there is a lot of possibility and like proven um, it's an avenue for medicinal discovery in the deep sea. Did you know about this? I didn't know about this. There's like four different anti-cancer drugs on the market that just have been um, isolated from deep sea organisms. Wow. And other medicines as well. And I think part of the part of, one of the theories that I read for this, why it's so kind of uh, rich for this type of thing, is that there are so many just very strange, <laughs> like weird, um, inanimate, basically immobile invertebrates mm. down below like you think of like a sponge or something it's like it can't really do much in terms of predation but they're kind of like filter feeders mm -hmm. so they have the potential to be eating also a lot of like parasites and bad microorganisms uh. and stuff so one of the theories is that a lot of creatures down there have very healthy um potent chemical production as like a, a self-protection mechanism mm. And another one is to like repel predators, it works both ways. Yeah, that's really, that makes a lot of sense. I saw recently a story about a girl who 
for years trained these little worms for their microbiome, like the things that digest food in their digestive tract. She trained it to be able to turn plastic into the building blocks to sustain their life. And then the only byproduct is like worm poo. So she engineered these little worms to break down plastic. And it's like, there's so many crazy things like this that could exist. But clearly this was a highly slow process. And going down to the bottom of the ocean is super expensive. Yeah. Very slow. It's really high risk. So most of, as you said, the R&D departments aren't going to be putting their money towards these things. But probably should be if we want to actually better society and better well-being yeah. and health. Well, there is a lot of industry that, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but there is industry that takes place far below the ocean. Mm -hmm. Mining, heavy metals, that kind of thing. There's a lot of deposits yeah. like that down there, which are all um, necessary materials for, let's say, turbines. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's interesting. Just like off topic a little bit, it's the premise for a lot of underwater horror movies. That's, a, that's kind of a micro niche genre yeah. that I'm a, a weird fan of. <laughs> um, because the deep sea scares me, so I love seeing it on film. We'll get into that a little bit later again. But it's a common premise in like an alien esque, like a uh, closed crew claustrophobia type horror film that they're mining for something, and then like <laughs> Cthulhu comes and starts attacking them. Yeah, exactly. Mining. Mm. It's like the earth fighting back. But you can do mining, not in a zero impact way, but there's, there's very bad ways to do it. Yes. And there's less bad ways to do it. Yeah, there needs to be less of a rush because most mining companies are in quite a rush to get as much out as quick as possible. But if you allow them to take a bit more time to not just have to dump all their waste into, you know, water supplies, yes. all that jazz, yeah, it can be done a bit better for the planet and people. What do you think about biomimicry, like human inventions, uh, mimicking the, those strange organisms of the deep sea? I think it's wonderful. I think that's how humans were supposed to work. We're supposed to create art and create technology based on the one inspiration that we all have, which is nature. Because where else are you going to get inspiration from unless a divine source, perhaps? But even that is all going to be inspired and populated by things that you've seen while alive. Yeah. So I think it's great. I read this article called Biomimicry, The Sea Inspires Our Future. And it was on marineocean.com. Recommend it. Very interesting. Referred to a lot of cool different um, concepts and inventions and designs that are inspired by like nautilus shells and mm. things that are even, even stranger. And I was just thinking like the overall lesson for this question regarding the solar scene is that one, life persists in very um, seemingly hostile mm. environments. And also the word that comes to mind when people describe these creatures is always alien. So I was mm -hmm. like, wow, they're so alien. Um, I already used it earlier. But that's just mostly because it's dark and cold, and so they evolve in a way that we don't on the surface. But I was thinking that the solar scene to now, like our buildings, will be to what current buildings are, like what the anglerfish is to like a dog. Mm, I see. Just like next level. Yeah. No offense to dogs, but <laughs> next level. Yeah. I was also thinking in the solar scene, the deep sea will have an almost godlike place in art and in society and in film and all that jazz, because it'll be probably more thoroughly explored, so it won't just be scary. Right now, when it's represented in film or art, it's a spooky thing. Yeah, good point. And if there's even a picture of it, it's just terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> but as technology evolves and we learn more, I think it'll not just be scary, it'll still have that mysterious wilderness vibe. It will also be inspiring, mm -hmm. and perhaps people will have a belief in something beyond humans again. Because it's like right now there's no frontier. There's nothing that we haven't really explored because we don't think about the deep sea or like deep space. We just think about what we know. Yeah. So I think it'll kind of push boundaries and almost cause people to have a wonder again. And maybe people will aspire to be deep sea divers and all that. Like me. Yeah. A and B. Two more things on this topic. One is the biological carbon pump, which basically refers to like the system underwater, purely through organisms by which carbon makes its way from the surface to be sequestered mm. deep below and uh, through sedimentation 
and obviously this is relevant from like an ecological standpoint to the solar scene because this is i think an almost like incalculable uh sequester for carbon very important kind of built-in stability feature that the planet has um actually i did see a value for it i say incalculable but it was something like the deep sea total i mean it, it tried to you know when they tried to like estimate the economic value of like a wetland yeah. or a mangrove it's like that for the entirety of the deep oceans but they were talking about well there's carbon sequestration but there's also all the coral that people use for jewelry and like the fishing and stuff and i was like i'm pretty sure that bails in comparison like money wise yeah. <laughs> but in any case the estimate i saw was something like 423 billion dollars a year okay so like pretty expensive, expensive. yeah um so th the reason this is important is because uh, marine ecosystems, like so many others, are being disrupted in ways that we don't really know, don't really understand that well. And if this one is disrupted too heavily, then of course that is a big issue mm -hmm. in yeah. a way that a lot of people wouldn't realize, you know, because it would be like an atmospheric result um, coming from the coming from the ocean. Yeah, like if all the carbon was just released into the atmosphere, we'd pass all ecosystem boundaries probably overnight. But people, I mean, I don't even think about the deep sea when I'm thinking about nature preservation and conservation and adaptation. It's just like I just think about the things that are very obvious and you can see, but you don't think about these things. But maybe we should. Maybe that's why we're shedding some light on them today. Uh, a fun point to end on my future home, also I want it to be, mm. is called the Jellyfish House. Yes. Um, I showed you a picture of this before we recorded. You did, and you were saying, oh, look how fun it would be to live here, slipping around inside the jellyfish house. <laughs> to me, it does, looks like probably the least fun place to live, what? but explain to us why so you think it would be a good there? place. No, this can be where you go to write or whatever. Yeah, this would be my fortress of solitude. If you yeah. had like a house that was, you know, the name preceded by an animal, what would you want it to be? Hmm. The toad house. I want to live in a toadstool, as we've... <laughs> As we've covered on here a few times. Yeah, okay. Um, so the Jellyfish House, this was not a real building. It was a concept by an architectural firm called Iwamoto Scott. It was designed in 2006, which kind of surprised me because it looks mm. to me like a, like a recent render, but I guess it's just maybe architecture has uh, stagnated in that regard a little bit. And it was a proposal put forward for an exhibition that was kind of asking for like, counterexamples to the idea of the smart home or the smart home of the future. And I would describe this building as just looking very organic and deep sea. A bit of a of a off the wall reference, but if anyone has played Zelda games, I said it reminds me a lot of Zora's domain. Mm. Zora are like the seafaring creatures of Zelda, and yeah. they have a a domain. There's no sharp effect. angles. There's no flat. In fact, there are, there are quite some, some sharp angles, but uh, yeah, there is a lot of curvature. Let me put it mm. like that. And it just seems like a very peaceful place to live. It looks like a wave if it was a building. Yes. And I think it's just a, a beautiful example of like that kind of uh, oceanic biomimicry, or as the, the brief for this house said, um, a new aqueous urbanism, which wow. I really, really like that term. So yeah, if people are interested, look that up and put forth some money so I can build it and live there, question mark? <laughs> <laughs> put forth some pledges for the jellyfish house to jellyfish become a reality. Kickstarter. And then the soundtrack for the house is just the jellyfish jam. But kind of like an orchestral version. That's how I picture it anyway. Okay. Um, one small question for today, getting off that jellyfish jam topic, was to rename the Boy Scouts and Girl Guides, not out of any kind of social justice reason, just for fun, perhaps a more naturey reason. Mm. So what I came up with, just the first two nouns that came into my head, was the pine cones and the seahorses. Okay, I like that. Yeah, if you want to ask about the gender for each, I'm not sure. Yeah. Because seahorses, those are kind of confused in that regard anyway, aren't they? Yeah, they don't have gender, so... And pine cones, I don't actually know what that is. Some kind of rock, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that those are, those are good names. So <laughs> for mine, I did decide to break down the distinction of which group of people will be in each. But it's instead, I made four categories. Right, weight kind classes. Kind of... No, uh, element based. So, which element right. Reminds they'll me be of interested in? Uh, cartoon. No, it was more inspired by like the Navy, the Air oh, Force, Army. the Air Army. Force. Okay. Yeah, the Space so Force. it's like that. Because in the solo scene, I don't think there's going to be cadets. Right, so you're going to, it's like your militaristic kids' camps. Yes, exactly. Okay. And boys, girls, 
whomever can join these. And so we have the Timber Titans, which obviously are in the woods. Yeah. Uh, it'll be very... You have to lift these branches. Sure. You have to slice the wood. Sounds like Titans. an American soccer team. Yeah. Okay. The Salty Scouts. Okay. For the water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, this one's too funny. Is there a fire-based one? Is that what you're saying? No. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> The Lava Lads. So I was going to do fire, but then I decided to do underground. Because, well, so you know, I moles? love tunnels. <laughs> there's just moles. Uh, the Dirty Dreamers. Just because <laughs> I thought that was too funny not to include. And then the Air Walkers, which is very inspired by, I don't know, it sounds like, Maverick. yeah, so the Air Walkers, which is the ones in the air, they fly a lot of kites, they, <laughs> I don't know what they do up you, there. Th- this is the solo scene, like, I'm usually the one who gets, like, fantastical yeah. about it, but you know they're not actually flying around, right? Maybe they are in the solo scene. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't actually make sense, but I just liked all these names, so, so I wanted like, to use them. It's like Divergent, where each kid is assigned one. From a young age, or can you be in multiple? Maybe you could be in multiple. Which would you, if you're divergent, which would you yeah. be in? I like the Salty Scouts mainly for the name. I have a question though. Who would want to be in the underground camp? Who would want to be a dirty <laughs> dreamer when everyone else is flying kites <laughs> and these kids are just wiping the dirt off their brow, <laughs> being your uh, your cheap waiver to mine? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what that are they one... doing under there? Spelunking? I don't know. Yeah, caves. They're t- <laughs> very pale. Yeah. <laughs> Getting lost. Yeah, I mean, I didn't think these through very much, but I just liked that name too much. And I was like, well, what could they be? They couldn't, the forest one's already taken. So they're in the <laughs> caves in the underground, exploring old mines. Anyway, those are my four. Thank you for listening to that. And speaking of... I think instead of thanking them, you should apologize. <laughs> Uh, speaking of Dirty Dreamers, this week's Organism of the Week is... A mole. A rabbit. It says, not a real photo. I'll describe it for the people at home. It's a rabbit with a cute bush-like tail. Um, wait, is that a is that a jackalope? Yeah, it's a jackalope. Oh, jackalope. This is so, one of my favorite cartoon creatures. Because there was a jackalope in Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders. Mm-hmm. Fun fact. On the Wikipedia page in like media... You know when it says, oh, media yeah, appearances? That's my favorite It wasn't section. on there. Well, maybe I should upload it. Yeah, I update think you should it. update it. But anyway, the jackalope is a fictional creature. What? They're not real. Hmm. But a lot of people believe they are real. When you ask me, I second-guessed myself. And so they're mythological. They've appeared in almost all cultures across the world, hmm. which is really, you know, a little suspicious. And when they were first documented in... Western science books, they were just listed as a real animal. And it's believed that there is a type of rabbit that has a virus called the Shop papilloma virus, which causes them to grow horn like protrusions. What? So it's like they're not real, but they also kind of are real. Wow. So I thought that was cool. And in 1932, there was the Douglas variant, which was a couple of bros in. Douglas, Wyoming, who were taxidermists, and they would just combine jackrabbits with deer horns and sell them to people. It was a hoax. Yeah, it was a hoax, but in Douglas, it's like the official mythological creature. There's a lot of newspapers, clubs, all named after the jackalope. Apparently, they can intimidate human voices, and if you're at a bonfire, you can hear them singing. Imitate. Yeah, you can hear them singing, and... If you want to lure one, their favorite drink is whiskey. So you just need to open up a little bottle of whiskey and they'll come to you. They're one of the most violent creatures. So if you're trying to hunt one, you need to put lead pipes over your legs so they don't take you out. I feel like the lead pipes might take you out. But these are just, um, they're just small rabbits though with horns, right? Big rabbits with horns. Oh, like knee height? It's a combination of jackrabbit and antelope. Oh, Jackalope. okay. Yeah. Uh, knee height. Yeah, they're they're very big. Like jackrabbits are. But they don't exist. No, they don't exist. Because okay, the way you say this, <laughs> oh, they're, no, they're decently big. Yeah, but when you see the the taxidermied versions, they're not like tiny little rabbits. They're yeah, chunky. Because I was genuinely excited, not even from like a being funny point of view. I was like, maybe we'll see a jackalope. Yeah. But we didn't. Yeah. Because they don't exist yet. So yeah, the reason I went with the mythological creature is because. 
We were talking about later in the episode spirituality and nature, and obviously mythological creatures have been around forever in mm-hmm. people's imaginations. And it's like, why do we project deities onto these hybrid creatures and these figments of our imagination? Like, why not project them onto real creatures or onto unknown? Like, we have this weird in between where we mush animals together. We create the unicorn. We create the the griffin. Exactly. So. It's an interesting part of the human psyche that I wanted to explore today. Maybe we can explore it more next week. Yeah. I'm thinking about how people, I don't know if this is actually true, but like the theory, or maybe it's maybe it itself is a myth, is that the idea of dragons came from people finding dinosaur bones and kind of extrapolating what mm-hmm. might have grown around them. Yeah. So maybe in some way we can talk about that next week. Dragons, mythological creatures. I like yeah. this. Okay, but the next question is, So the next question, which you just introduced, is about spirituality and nature. Slightly less mythological, but still as interesting, I would say. I obviously just decided to talk only about movies for this question. Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, like, what was the exact question? How, How does do... spirituality and nature interact? Yes. Yes. It's a little bit more your forte. So. You said, when we asked this question, what if we talk about it in the context of movies? And to <laughs> me, those two are just completely separate. Right. So this is kind of just us answering two different questions. Yes, because I didn't want to answer the main question. Yeah. But that was part of the reason I wanted to talk about movies is because they seem quite opposed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was trying to reason this through. And film is almost always indoor, always sitting still to view it. And it's a, it's a capture of things, even though the pictures move. It's, the, it's like when with uh, sitcoms, for laugh, laugh tracks of sitcoms, people go, wow, those people are all dead now. It's dead people's laughter. And it's like, yeah, whatever. But in the case of nature, it's always like that because it captures something that three weeks later will look completely different. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, everyone in, every rabbit in there will most likely be D-E-D now. <laughs> Whereas spirituality, I had the definition of that. From Google, so take it with a pinch of salt. Um, (laughs) The quality of being concerned with the human spirit or soul as opposed to material things. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that nature and film is is kind of almost always just the material of it. Mm -hmm. And nature in general, like we often consider that, even from like a we're praising it point of view, you know, putting value on it, it's for the materials. Mm -hmm. And I don't even mean like anthropocentric, but it's like, wow, look at this fern. How so splendid, complex. how complex, look yeah. at the, the biology of it and such. Whereas a spiritual uh, naturism or a spiritual nature film is kind of almost by definition concerned more with the, the ephemeral yes, elements of it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I don't know if I said fifth dimension, but like the, <laughs> the thing that is, the thing that the tree is a larger part of rather than yes. the tree in, in some way. Yeah, that makes sense. That was kind of my my reasoning for it yeah i see a lot of films have done the most for conveying to us 21st century lost souls how important nature is not just for our survival but for our flourishing Mm. i think yeah i had the examples that i had i'll start with the one that uh you haven't seen i don't believe very short film called offering came out in 1978. I watched it a couple years ago, and it still stuck with me. It's only like two minutes, so someone can look it up and watch it. I think it's on Vimeo. Uh, shout out Vimeo, the more artsy YouTube. Um, and it was by a director called Claudio Caldini, and he was kind of a famous, or is kind of a famous, like uh, experimental film maker, often uses a Super 8 camera. I think he used one for this film. And this is just like a very rapid flashing series of Daisies. I think they're daisies. It's just the generic white petals yeah. with the yellow centers. And I would say it's hypnotic. I don't want to say it's like the most profound thing because there's no dialogue. I don't even think there's any music, but it's just a series of this imagery. And I had a quote by him regarding the, the film. He said, Someone once asked me what was indeterminate or fortuitous in the capture of the sequence of images. The plant kingdom, with its multiplication of simple forms, is invoked here to provide an explanation. So this one obviously touches a little bit more on film than on nature with regards to the spirituality of it. But I still think it's a really cool, very short meditation on exactly what I was Mm -hmm. talking about. There's like 
the materiality of things and there's the more ephemeral, holistic view of things. And that's what this film is kind of uh, exploring, in, in my opinion. Like, it's very short, yeah. and like I say, I don't want to sound pretentious because there isn't much to it. It's very bare bones. It's just mm -hmm. a, a flash of imagery. So it's, it's more about the, the edit, I suppose. Yeah. The seasons. It's like the seasons in one. Kind of yeah. like that. It's almost like... I'm going to stop talking about it. The next movie, <laughs> um, going further forward in time, 1994's Pompoko. You have seen this film. Mm -hmm. Studio Ghibli film, uh, renowned for its rather interesting anatomical, uh, magical realism. Yeah. With regards to the Tanuki depicted, what do you want to say about Pompoko? It's a great climate change movie. It's about these creatures, the Tanuki, who are losing their habitat, and they're slowly realizing that they have to do something about it. Yeah. And then the last scene of them is in a green space doing their traditional ritual instead of when they used to just do these rituals in the deep forest. Yeah. Very sad. I don't want to spoil what happened with the green space. At least we put in air quotations. Mm -hmm. But watch it and find out. This film I really like because it it gives me the it's it's funny because it's like a a musical zany cartoon, mm -hmm. but it it's generally or genuinely poignant i find in the way that it gives you nature's perspective nature's pov in the way that no other movie ever has that i've seen yeah like you really feel for these and perhaps this blends in well to what you have on this uh question because this film i think is a good example of animism specifically shintoism yeah so i did go into just basically giving a few definitions of different religions and spiritual practices and cultures around the world that nature plays a central role in because growing up in Canada I wasn't exposed to many religious ideas like I knew a few I knew of basically the people around me what they practiced and that was it and then when I went to university we learned about the hundreds and thousands of different <laughs> belief systems that exist and it really is wonderful to hear how different people communicate the same human experience they just have different sets of words for it and different practices of like how they enact these beliefs. So I just wanted to kind of go through a few, but we'll start with Shintoism because that's what you alluded to. It's an ancient Japanese religion and it is the belief that spiritual power exists in the natural world and not just in like animate objects, but in Rocks. inanimate objects and in phrases and this is kind of what animism is as a whole, is just like, I always thought it was just animism is animals have spirits, <laughs> but it's so much more than that. It's like a handcrafted object could have a spirit and it obviously just lends itself to caring for everything. Yeah. Like when you recently, what's her name? Marie Kondo kind of came into the mainstream with her decluttering ideas of like thanking an object for its service to you and like, holding it and asking yourself, does this bring joy? Does this bring happiness? Yeah. And it's like very foreign to a lot of us because it's mm -hmm. like almost to get through our daily lives, we have to act like nothing has a spirit or nothing has any innate value. It only has the value you give to it, which is partially what she believes, but also like there's just things that have died for everything. Like a table, a tree had to die for it or yes. a piece of cloth, like a cotton plant had to die for it. And it's having... A respect for things that goes so much deeper than just the the value that you assign to it but that it has a value in itself we had a i think buddhist teacher in middle school who like almost made the whole class cry because one time <laughs> one of the kids was having like a tantrum and he like threw his backpack and the teacher he was this very old man and he was like what did this backpack do to you and he <laughs> like kept going into basically what you just uh described and everyone was just captivated for like three minutes uh, yeah listening. that's the kind of school i went to sounds kind of <laughs> magical but it wasn't that magical yeah um, so that's Shintoism and kind of animism, which transcends almost all religions in some yeah. in some way or another. The uh, the first Zoocene poem, also an introduction to the Zoocene, there's a line that's like, humans treading on the earth as if they tread upon the face of their mother, which is like a, mm -hmm. kind of a dark like saying, but it's, ju it's just kind of what you describe, which is move nicely, wholesome, yeah. wholesome dudes. Yeah, as move consciously. <laughs> yeah, and in... I'll say the Abrahamic religions to kind of group them so they don't spend all day here. But in the Abrahamic religions, 
there's the thought that you shouldn't have idols. So it's like assigning a spirit to anything other than God is blasphemous. But I think in that practice of trying to not create idols out of physical objects, we have forgotten the fact that like nature and everything in this world is an extension of the divine, but we've kind of avoided it. And it is still kind of contentious when interpreting the Bible and the Torah, because it's like, are we sure that this is not idol worship? And I think if you deconstruct biblical texts, the result is that you are in fact supposed to respect nature almost at the same level that you respect God because it is one and the same. And so I think that's important. I guess we talked about that in the What Would Jesus Do episode a bit more. And then the one religion that when I was exposed to it, I was like, this is so extreme, but so beautiful to know that there's people who are this selfless, but Jainism blew my mind in that they believe the path to enlightenment is through nonviolence, which is like, yeah, that, that is good, but it's not just nonviolence to fellow humans, but it's to literally everything. Like you were saying with the backpack, it's like... Sweeping the sidewalk for insects. Yeah, so when they walk, they sweep. Yeah. So they don't step on a bug, and it's just like, that level of consciousness, to me, would be exhausting. It's like to be terrified that you're going to step on an ant or on you're going to like knock into something and knock it over. But this is just so beautiful and just such a respectful way to live. And I think that the world could use a little bit more of this in their daily lives in whatever way it manifests. But as I'm saying, it's like almost all religions and cultures have this, but we've kind of come away from it because we're so distant from nature. It's like nothing in this room is really natural. So it's like we kind of forget that if we knock a book off the shelf or we spill a cup of water that it's disrespecting that object because it's like oh that was just a mistake but I think we could kind of you know embody this a little bit better and one thing that I also learned was that a lot of people see Carl Linnaeus and a few other naturalists so people who believe the only laws in the universe are natural laws but they're actually regarded also as hyper spiritual because it's like they are reverent to these laws and they spend time learning about them and they respect them. They don't just learn these laws of like, yeah, what goes up must come down. It's like, it has to, like, it's almost a faith. And I feel like you don't have to be religious to be spiritual when it comes to nature. You can just respect nature for its massive power. Yeah. And some places it's like weather systems are considered divine and so on. And so even if you don't think there's a literal God causing this wind, you believe there's a set of Very physical laws. <laughs> uh, winds or something. Yeah. Yeah, that last part sounds a little bit too Neil deGrasse Tyson for me, but we'll move on. Uh, the last <laughs> film that I wanted to talk about was Dune, 2021 Dune, not the David Lynch one. That one is best left <laughs> unregarded, possibly. Um, and this one, it wasn't exactly in as positive light as I think Pompoko is. Like, we can both agree that's a great climate uh, habitat loss film. It's just a a really cool, reverent, I say spiritual because it has the animism, but also and a lot of references to like uh, Japanese yokai, those creatures, um, but also because it feels like a funeral and it feels about as reverent towards nature as even, you know, nominally like atheist people feel around the time of a death. Like that's how mm -hmm. that movie makes me feel. It's hard to explain. But in Dune, I don't think it's, I don't think my feelings towards it and its nature are as positive i still think it's overall a, a, an interesting piece of art what do you think about this dune is definitely a bit more social justicey in that it incorporates the people and how it impacts the people a bit more than a lot of other nature films like a lot of nature films choose to just show the sad polar bear on the ice melting but dune's a bit more social and economic i think and a bit more brutal I suppose. Yeah, I was going to say it's, well, both of those points, actually. I just think it's it's generally, it's a nice contrast with Pompoku, because I said about the latches puts you in the animal's POV. This one is distinctly anthropocentric, I think. Mm -hmm. Despite, you know, people always say about Frank Herbert, the author of the books, um, was a great ecologist. And the films, uh, the books, excuse me, have a, have a wonderful, like, nature is a character or the main character, and it's all about 
ecology of Arrakis or the other planets. I don't exactly think that. I think one line from the book that comes to mind is when the protagonists, not the antagonists, um, talk about desert power in such a like uh, exciting um, way. And what mm -hmm. this means is we're going to harness the forces of the desert for militaristic purposes. And I mean, the reason I'm a little bit complex on it is because if that were the case and it was just that and those were the protagonists talking about essentially exploiting the, the natural resources for their own gain, I'd be like, that doesn't sound great. But um, I mean, Dune, the film is only half finished, but in the book, it's like the protagonists that we follow aren't good people yeah. or really supposed to be good. So that's why I think it's quite, a, quite an interesting exploration of those themes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have to like hope that they'd be doing so sustainably because Dune definitely takes the more, as you said, anthropocentric perspective of how really we do interact with nature. It doesn't take the Solocene idealistic perspective. It's more like technic like if we talk about the environment in economical terms or in how it can greatly benefit us, that's usually the most effective way to communicate these things. Yes. But I don't think it's sustainable in the long term because it will always put nature below us. Well it the, the film and the book, they kind of contrast the approaches of, let's say, the villains, the Harkonnens, the bold people, and the way that they just basically produce spice as quickly as possible without understanding or whatever. Spice being the main resource of note, and the Fremen, who are very holistic in their understanding, and you know they tread nicely and all that kind of thing. Yeah. But I think what's interesting about it is that the spice and just the resource, the power of the nature in general is described in such a divine term. Mm. I mean, even the music that plays when like the worm appears and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, contrast with the humans who are kind of depicted as like, uh, just very fleeting, very mm. transient. It's like sometimes these guys are in charge, sometimes these guys are in charge. The Fremen even, it's like when someone dies, they take their water. Mm -hmm. So there's a, it's an interesting spiritual dichotomy there. Yeah. Moving on, third question or fourth question of the day, I suppose, is about designing the solar scene national park slash zoo. Yes. So I'm just going to describe mine. I'm really happy with how this turned out. I'm Usually, not, I'm not with mine. Though. My designs, I'm not super excited about. But this one, it just kind of came to me in a in a vision, <laughs> <laughs> sitting in a cafe, staring out at Mont Royal, and so. The Solacy National Park, there'll be obviously multiple, but they're going to have staggered openings during different seasons. So it's like Park A is going to be open during spring one year, winter the next year, fall, so that the ecosystem can mainly be undisturbed. But during like two, three months a year, that one park is open, but otherwise it'll be a different park that's open. And this will allow it to yeah regenerate. And there'll be some springs where it's untouched, but maybe one spring every four years where it is touched. And I like that idea. Um, it also creates some mysteries. Like, oh, you can't, you can only go there in the spring every four years. It's like the World Cup, <laughs> but of national parks. And you can only see winter there once in a while. Yeah, sure. I think it'd be kind of cool, create a little bit more mystery. Camping will be allowed when they're open. And there'll be lots of facilities that can kind of pop up because I don't love when you're in the middle of the woods and you're kind of like you need to use the bathroom and you kind of feel like you're going to destroy something by accident or like step on a nest. So it'll be, <laughs> it won't be marked, but there'll be a lot of forest rangers to point to in the right directions. And the national parks will all have little like museum, veterinary clinics at the entrance. So in these, this will be the zoo part. There'll be veterinarians working on rehabilitating animals or propagating certain species of plants mm -hmm. to help. Because humans will have a good relationship with these national parks. They won't just be the forest rangers. They'll be one and the same. They'll be working together. And so in these little museums, that's what you'll see going on. That'll be the exhibit is people working with animals or working with plants. Finally, to gain entrance, you don't pay. But you exchange hours of work for the oh, hours that you're going to be there. So that's so, like a prison. <laughs> so basically, okay, I want to go camping overnight. You'll have to put in like three hours of work in the morning of like cleaning up trails or 
maybe clearing some paths, cleaning up the museum. This might not work exactly. Maybe you'd only have to t like exchange an hour of work for like 10 hours of use because there might not end up being that much to do if we are letting them kind of run their course naturally most of the year. But I think that's kind of a fun idea. And maybe I was also toying around with the idea of a sort of training you have to do to be able to use the parks. Like when you join a rock climbing gym, you have to do like an hour of training to know how to use everything so that you don't hurt yourself or hurt someone else. Okay. So I think some kind of training program to gain access. Yeah, they'll be free other than that. And they'll be free gear rental, free camping equipment so that everyone doesn't have to own everything. It's like you can just borrow it from these parks. And that'll be another purpose of the like clubhouse thing that's at the entrance of them. And yeah, there'll be a lot more. And they'll be a lot more vast. Merchandise or no? I like modern um, national park merchandise, but I don't think in the solo scene, as much as I like it and always find it looks cool, I think it's kind of antithetical to the idea of the solo scene. Why is that? Because it's like, who is making this? Hmm. Perhaps there'd be some kind of merchandise made by people who live in the area inspired by the using the, museums. the local beaver pelts yeah using the materials and maybe you can like press a flower and have like a pressed flower in a frame but i don't like the logos like the this is the yosemite national park logo on your shirt or on your water bottle hmm. i don't love that as much but yeah maybe local artisans selling their work that's inspired by the park kettle corn or no i like snacks okay snacks are a cool idea um feeding the animals with it or no no, no, no. Okay. That's what the training's for. <laughs> <laughs> Mine also came to me in something like a vision, except I'm not sure it was a vision from above. It might have been from below. This is the <laughs> idea. Um, the picture was, I think it's called Woohoo Island from Wii Sports Resort, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. maybe some other Wii games, actually, on Nintendo games. Yeah. Um, which it just seems like always very I idyllic and bright to me. So the island looks like that, but a lot less built uh, infrastructure. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is um, if this works as a national park slash zoo or more of a game show, but I'll describe it anyway. <laughs> um, so it's an island. I didn't like specify the latitude or longitude, so it could be anywhere. That houses like all natural ecosystems. There's no cages, nothing like that. Yeah. Like I say, it's a rainforest, mm -hmm. and people can visit, and they the task is to it's called Habitat Lost Island, by the way. Okay. But it's a bit of a, a spin or a reclamation of the term because those losing their habitat are the, the humans. Ah, uh, yes. So yes. they have kind to... Kind of a naked and afraid type situation. A little yeah. bit like that. They have to nature bob themselves and the people who... Uh, SpongeBob Nature Pants, it is. The people who, um, after, let's say, their week's stay, impact the least, like have the smallest footprint, win a prize. <laughs> What do you think about that? I realize it is partially a zoo, but with humans as the, as the animals. This feels yeah. um, wrong on several levels, yeah, to be honest. Legal, legal levels, perhaps. Legal levels, um, yeah, well-being of but the But people would sign up creatures. for it, and it's like, why would people sign up for it? I think one of the reasons is that same feeling that's why do rich people go to those restaurants where they get shouted at? Yeah. You know those restaurants where it's like the waiter insults them? Mm -hmm. It's like that. Um, what I'm seeing here is something that me, won't happen in the solo scene. Let me explain something. There, there is infrastructure, a cafeteria, nice uh, bathroom, that kind of thing. But you get points taken off if you have to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're encouraged to feed yourself with, let's say, the oysters that collect on the rocks, you know, in the tidal pools. Mm. But you don't want to eat too many because then, you know, you're trying to minimize your impact. Yeah. If you want to, let's say, catch an animal to eat, you could, I don't know, just go flinging around arrows from your bow and arrow. Yeah. Um, but that might, you know, impact things in other ways. So you have to be smart with your traps and such. Or how do you get to the island? Are you going to fly? You're already working in the negatives. Yeah. So you can take a slow boat, something like that. Okay. I hear you. I will maybe try and think about that a little bit more. And maybe that's a question for me next week. Is this ethical? <laughs> <laughs> is this legal? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was thinking what I have written down here is not too dangerous. Cliffs, but no jaguars. Okay, so the thing is, I get the point of this. And I think it's, <laughs> it's good to an extent, but I think it would need to be toned down 
to a, a big degree. So maybe within a national park, there's a have you ever played Wii Sports? A free range human area where you can do yeah. whatever you want. That, this when game. you put it like that, that just sounds yeah downright sadistic. Yeah, it doesn't feel like something that would exist in the Soul Seed. It seems like something that might exist now, today. Yeah, like NBC, you're welcome. Yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I've played Wii Sports Resort. Okay. Many hours running in place. I think I sound like an indoor kid a lot today. But you know why that is? Why? Because recently I've been indoors quite you a bit. You have been. You've been writing. Yeah, you've been... Coldness. Making banana bread. All these things. So. Okay. <laughs> we should come up with one more question for next week. Though. A serious yeah. nature one. Um, pertaining to the, the real scientific issues of... Are there... Could we do a kind of report on the average person's impact when they're on a camping trip or on a vacation? Like maybe we can break it down into a few different categories. The, the environmental impact of leisure. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>